Uh, I want us to go to 2 Samuel chapter number 11. I just want to read one verse, uh, bring that up in your attention, and then we'll, we'll get started here. 2 Samuel chapter number 11, verse 27, it says, And when the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife, bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. I want to read it again. And when the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. I want you to highlight this part right here. It says, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. As we've been looking at this series, The Broken Kings, we've been looking at the kings of the Old Testament, and we're seeing these kings and their their insufficiencies, their failures, their flaws in light of the all-sufficient God. And this series here is calling us to, to see not just their stories and narratives, but to see a all-sufficient God. Uh, last week, we looked at what we call the disobedient king. We looked at King Saul and his direct disobedience of God's direction. Uh, here it is that these kings, that while they are failure and flawed, these are what the people wanted and God permitted But we see this king that disobeys God. And if we see King Saul as a disobedient king this week, I want to look at King David as a displeasing king. This king that 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 didn't directly disobey God here, but he he lives his life in a way, he makes a course of decisions. His heart is so full here of, of the wrong things that are not of God, and his behavior displeases God. And I want us to see this, that, that what I believe that happens with David is that David is not on guard, not on guard. His guard has been let down, and the things that he does displeases God. This idea of not being on guard is, is really important here. Uh, I'll give you this one story uh, since it is Mother's Day. My mother, uh, she, I think since I was about 13 or 14, uh, Jason, I got a little taller than my mother, uh-huh. And I got a little bit bigger than her, and, and she wanted to remind me, don't, don't, you, don't you get by your raising. I don't know if y'all, where y'all from, I'm from the country, and they would say something like this, you start smelling yourself. <laughs> it's this idea, you think you're somebody. So I remember, Steve, I, was, I would stand up. I would stand up as tall as I could because I could look down on my mother. I remember this. I remember this season in my life, don't judge me, but it was a real one. But my mother would do something. Uh, quite often, around this age, 13 or 14, my mother would wait until I was watching TV on the couch, and maybe I fell asleep, maybe I was laying on the couch, and my mother, she would sneak up behind me, and she would put her arm around my neck. <laughs> just just, just, just a, a ever so slight chokehold to remind me, don't, don't sleep on me, son. <laughs> you never know where I am. Don't ever get too comfortable. This is my Mother's Day story right here for you. My mother would put me in a chokehold. And she would, to this day, if I go to my mother's house and I fall asleep on the couch, she's going to put her arms around my neck. I just want you to feel my strength. <laughs> this idea that she caught me off guard. I want you to see this. That, that in the moment where I felt I was most comfortable, the moment I felt like I was doing just right, a little strength came on and caught me off guard. Here, here's the issue that we have in the text, that, that we find David who, who falls, dare I say, steps into sin because he's not living on guard. He's not living on guard. He he has let his guard down. This reminds me of uh, the movie uh, uh, Jurassic Park, the lost Jurassic Kingdom, the Jurassic World movies that restarted in 2015. There's a, there's a storyline here where, where Chris Pack's, Pratt's character, Owen, he, he, he tells this young worker, this new guy here, never turn your back on the cage. In the cage, y'all remember this may be those velociraptors. And he says, listen, do you want to know how this job opening came about that you just got? (laughs) He's trying to get him to understand, don't don't turn your back on these raptors. 
Because just when you let your guard down, you are most susceptible to danger. And I believe this is what is happening here with King David. He has gotten this new job as king, as we find in the latter parts of 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel here. And while he does not make the same mistake the previous king made, he turns his back on the cage of sin. He turns his back, I believe, on his flesh. He turns his back and he lets his guard down. He gets comfortable as king. He has found security in his success. And I believe turns his back and he's forgotten the words, I believe, that God says to Cain right before he kills Abel. He says, sin lieth at the door crouching, seeking to have you. His guard was down. This idea, listen to me, church, that sin is a wild animal. And you can never turn your back on it. Your flesh can always be tamed. You must be on guard. If Saul turned his back on God in disobedience, David turned his back on his own flesh by letting his guard down. And if we're honest here, we can all say this to be true, that we have made similar mistakes. There are moments in my own life where I've, I've underestimated God and I've overestimated myself. There have been times in my life where I thought I, I had it all figured out. And I let my guard down and I fell into sin. I want you to write this down here. Uh, my uncle, Bishop Brooks, taught me this early on, I believe, while I was at North Carolina a t State University. He says, Ryan, all ground has the potential to become quicksand under the right conditions. His idea, he was saying, don't, don't, don't ever think that this, this could never happen to you. There's a lot of times we make the mistake of saying, I could never do this. A lot of times we sit in judgment of somebody else and say, how could they have done this? And we don't understand that under the right conditions... You could fall to sin just like anybody else. All ground has the potential to become quicksand under the right conditions. Maybe, just maybe the reason why you haven't failed to that sin is not because you are so strong and wise. You just haven't been under the right conditions yet. But we must remain on guard. Yes. So here it is. I want us to lean into this today. And we take away from this narrative as we do this character study of King David I want you to write this. Our main idea for our time together today is faithfulness to God calls us to be on guard against sin. Faithfulness to God calls us to be on guard against sin. Let's lay some context here. I think this is important. David has become king. David was chosen king in the latter middle part of 1 Samuel to replace whom the Spirit of God had left in King Saul. God had regretted, the Bible says, that he had made Saul king. The latter parts of 1 Samuel speak to the overlapping story of the fall of King Saul and the rise of David. It's interesting as we read David's narrative up until what we see in 2 Samuel in chapter number 11, David has pretty much had a remarkable story. He would have appeared to be the, the model follower of God, the perfect candidate for a king. We see him with victorious battles. He has compassionate love for his friend. He is a loyal servant, a humble leader, a gracious king, and a follower of God. Yet, as I said before, all ground under the right conditions have the potential to become quicksand. This is what we find in David in this narrative. David begins to have this tragic turn. Some would say this is the beginning of the fall of David in chapter number 11. The truth of the matter is, is that some of us, we don't like this part of David's story because we want David to be the hero of the story. The truth of the matter is, is we were talking about this in our staff meeting. Yana brought this up. There's only one hero in the Bible. Everybody else are just characters. There's only one hero in the text. We like, to, we like to see David as hero because we can see some of us in David and say, well, if David can be a hero, so can I. 
The truth of the matter is there's only one hero, God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, three in one. There are no other Bible heroes, just Bible characters. David is much just an instrument. He's not the emphasis of Scripture. This understanding would have been critically important to the reader in the uh, Old Testament here. It, here it is, because it is not King David who we should look up to. It's God. It is not King David whom we should put our hope in. It's God. David is another one of, God, of Israel's kings who fails. But we have a king that never fails. So what the question is, is what do we do with this text? Now remember, we are doing a character study to go through this Broken King series. We want to ask the questions, what are the warnings we should avoid? What is the worship we should replicate or duplicate? And, and honestly, what is the will of God that we should pursue? Today, I want to look at just really one of those questions uh, uh, for our time together, and that is, what's the warning here we see in the story of David? I've wrestled with this so much because I think there's so much in this text, chapter number 11, chapter number 12, but what, as I prayed about this, God says, Ryan, I want you to preach warning. I said, but Lord, it's Mother's Day. He said, warning is the subject that we have here today. So number one, I want you to write this down. Here, here's where we're going. Number one, we got to see a warning to watch. As we look at this narrative, as we look at the character of David, we want to observe not why did David do what he did. It's not the right question. The question is how do we prevent from doing what David did? Amen? Okay. Here it is. A warning to, to, to watch. Warning to, to, to watch. The first thing you, you got to watch is your comfort. Watch your comfort. Warning to watch the comfort we see from David here is, is interesting. Watch your comfort. This is probably one of the most disturbing and unsavory stories in all of the Old Testament. I got to be honest with y'all, this is, this is not going to be pretty as we walk through this text. But I want to make sure here at Vertical Church, we, we don't do the, the lazy work of skipping over the uncomfortable parts of Scripture. It is there for a reason. I do believe it can bring glory to God. Let's go to verse number 1, 2 Samuel chapter number 11. Watch your comfort. First, 2 Samuel chapter number 11, verse 1 through 2, it's right here. It lays it out for us. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Reba. But David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon or one evening when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house. And he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. I believe this is the beginning, if not early parts of, of this, this falling, this uh, uh, laying down your guard, this putting your guard down, this, this not living on guard is that David had gotten comfortable. We find here what I call a blessed warrior. You got to see this, Adam. You have to imagine David had been on the run at one point in time for years from King Saul due to his acclaim and fame as a successful warrior. And truthfully, this privilege now that he has become king has blessed him. He, he, he has, has now influence and power and authority. He has privilege. How do you know this, Pastor? Because he has the ability not to go to war anymore, but he sends people. This comfort is, is dangerous here. This blessing it's dangerous. I got to be honest, there are times in my life where, where comfort has been the thing that has tempted me, has caused me to sin. Mm -hmm. It is my comfort and privilege at times that has caused me to actually have a stumbling block in my relationship with God. Let's be honest here. The thing sometimes we've prayed for has often become the thing that is the barrier to my relationship with God. If we're not careful, blessings can have the tendency to cause us to forget how dependent we should be on God. Can you just imagine again that King David is, is in the palace? He's, he's living it up. He, he sent Joab to fight his battle. 
He's doing good. But he's forgotten God. Man, I can be honest with you. I've seen it happen so many times. We pray for a job, but now we don't have time for God and his work. We've prayed for God to bless us with children, and now our children dominate our calendar. We pray for relationships. Now we live to please others and not God. We pray for more free time, but now we don't have time to pray, study, and serve. He's a blessed king, but it actually creates a condition. It creates the opportunity for him to make a mistake. Secondly, we see a disengaged warrior. He's a blessed warrior, but he's disengaged. Uh, He has forgot his assignment. I love this that the author shows us that it is during the time when kings would go out to battle. It's actually speaking to us being springtime. As as kings, it would not be helpful to go out to battle or to war in winter. It's hard to travel. It's hard to move men. But this would be the time if you're going to defend or you're going to pursue. This would be the time. And it says, listen, that David did not do this. He forgot his assignment, his responsibility as king, and he is known as a warrior. The one thing that you're good at, why aren't you doing that, bro? If you were, if you were doing what you were supposed to do, you would have never got caught up in what you did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this king is disengaged. It's the same David that once brought honor to the shame in Mephibosheth. Now he is about to bring shame to the honor of Bathsheba. He, he's, he's forgotten his assignment. He's, he's got away from his responsibility. Instead of being where a king is supposed to be, he had the pleasure of sending his armor, the privilege of sending his army out. He has found himself in a dangerous place. I want you to write this down if you can. Comfort, watch this, can cloud your judgment. When judgment is not submitted to God. Comfort can cloud your judgment. When things get too easy, when, it, when it's, you, you, you start thinking you're doing a thing and not God. I say this a lot of times, that success can lie to you. Success will tell you that you did it. Instead of understanding that God did it despite you. (laughs) At no point have we seen David consult with God about this battle. At no point does the author tell us that David prayed and God said, you don't have to fight this one. No, no, he, he decides this on his own. I want you to see David is casually idle, creating an opportunity to be tempted. David is at his leisure, y'all. He was, he was laying on the couch. There ain't nothing more comfortable than saying, I'm just say right here. I want you to see this while Joab has been given the assignment to, to wage war. David doesn't even realize that sin is waging war on him. He's not just a, a, a disengaged warrior. Lastly, he's a wandering one. I want you to understand this. When you have no focus, anything could grab your attention. When you have no focus, anything could grab your attention. David is wandering. The Bible says that he was walking. Some some interpret this that he was pacing back and forth on the roof, and he sees a woman bathing who is beautiful. Many believe that a proper interpretation is that he was just going back and forth. He was uneasy and unsettled. It's why he couldn't even... Enjoy his comfort. <laughs> My uncle would tell me this. One, when I was in college, I would tell him, man, I'm having a hard time sleeping, man. I, I can't sleep. He says, oh, because you're not working hard enough. <laughs> and he would give me some project moving stones or digging a hole, and he would wake up and say, how'd you sleep? Slept great. I want you to see this leisure cause you to be a wanderer. Let's be honest here. We've got we to make sure we see the text rightly here. At no point does the text blame Bathsheba for David's wandering. At no point do we see the text blame Bathsheba for David not being at war. This is his his. 
His lowering of his guard puts him in the position of temptation. Bathsheba was the woman who was doing what was honorable and decent given the situation and circumstances. Let's be clear. She was not trying to seduce David. Regardless of what I've seen some people say, she was not trying to seduce David. The text says to to us that she was beautiful. This in no way justifies David's behavior and what he would display in the following text. David's awareness of her beauty, let's be clear, is not a substitute for love. I've seen people say that David fell in love with Bathsheba when he saw her. Revisionist history, we we don't want to our heroes to look like they did anything wrong. He did not fall in love with her, y'all. He saw her and desired her. Mm. I want you to see this, that Bathsheba was not David's temptation. I, I know, I know. Bathsheba tempted David. No, no, no. That's not the temptation. Seeing her is not the temptation. It's the temptation of what he did because he saw her. That's the temptation. It's it's his response, the temptation to respond to what he saw, to respond to his desire. I want you to understand temptation is never without. It's always within. This is why many of us can see the same thing but not be tempted the same way. Because the thing that is constant doesn't change. What is different is what's going on within. Let's not make Bathsheba the cause of David's temptation. No, the cause of David's temptation is his guard was down. He was not watching his comfort. His temptation, y'all, was was in his heart. It's not about what you see. How do we know this? Let's look at Jesus. Jesus is tempted in the wilderness. Satan doesn't show Jesus a piece of bread, and then he's tempted. That's not what happens. The temptation is to say, listen, I will turn this stone into bread so that you can be full. The temptation is within him. It's not the bread that's tempting. It's the desire that fulfills something in an ungodly way. That is temptation. It's to say, God, I want, I want a, a God thing in an ungodly way. It's to accomplish God's, trying to accomplish God's will without God's way. It was not God's desire for, for David to have Bathsheba. Sex is designed for marriage. And he pursues this outside of God's will and way. Temptation. She's not the temptation. It's what's going on in his heart. Bathsheba never tempted David. He did that all by himself. It's the conversation that he has that says, oh, I can have her. All I got to do is, do you see what I'm saying? David I don't believe got up that morning with intention to do all the things that he would soon do. I don't think that he got up that morning with intention to to hurt, to murder, to misuse his authority. Dare I say rape? That wasn't the intention when he got up that morning. But because his guard was down, it happened. Hear, Hear this. If you continue to get up without a purpose you will eventually go to bed with a problem. Saints, we must be on guard. You got to watch your comfort. Number two, you got to watch the signs. Watch the signs. How do we learn from this? Be careful in your comfort. Am I so comfortable? (laughs) But now we see signs. Steve, there were all the signs there. Yana, I, I, the more I read it, I was like, he had all the signs to say, hey, bro, stop. L- let me show it to you. It's right here in the text. Second Samuel verse, chapter number 11, verse 3 through 5. And David sent and inquired about the woman. He says, who is that? What's her name? 
Where is she from? Watch the text, y'all. And one said, is not this Bathsheba the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her. And she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from uncleanliness. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. Y'all, David ain't a hero. God is. David had every opportunity to buy out of this. Let me just show you a couple of the signs. The first sign is someone told him, isn't this Uriah's wife? Isn't this Eliam's daughter? Here's the first sign. She's not an object. First sign. David, you treat her like an object, bro. She's not an object. The writer notes that she is Iliam's daughter. This is significant because woman is not an object of your lust. She is one made in the image of God, a daughter, a sister, a mother, a friend, and deserves to be treated with dignity. She's not an object. Truth be told, if you go back and read this, actually, in in 2 Samuel 23, we'll find out who Iliam is. Eliam is actually one of the mighty men of valor that belong to David. Chapter 37, chapter 23, here it is. David is dying, and, and he lists out the 37 men that, that were his mighty men of valor. That one of them is Eliam. So a man that, that was going to give his life for you to protect you, you're going to take his daughter? She's not an object. Not only that, but we find that she is the granddaughter of one of his trusted counselors in 2 Samuel 15, 12. One of the men that you went to for wise counsel, you're going to take advantage of his granddaughter? She's not an object. This is his first sign. Hey, man, don't do this. I I feel like the the servant was like, hey, hey, uh, isn't that the wife? Isn't that the daughter? Trying to get King David not to go down this road. The second sign, she's not yours. She's already spoken for. This is the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. I kept wondering, why why we got a name where he's from? It gives clarity to who he was. Because if we go back, this same Uriah is also one of the 37 men. That are men of valor, the mighty warriors of David. She's not yours. She, She already belongs to him. Watch this. In covenant with God, she's married. You got to remember this covenant is not just between a man and a woman. A covenant is between a man and a woman and God. She's already been given over to the hand of Uriah. Uriah belongs to her and she belongs to him. She was valued by her husband in the sight of God. Third sign, here's the problem. You should have stopped here. She had to be taken. This is the text right here, verse number four. So David sent messengers and took her. I want y'all to see this. This is where many get this, and I do, I believe this this language of abuse, of power, of rape. Like, she didn't want to come. He does not send her an invite. He doesn't roll up in her DMs. No, he sent messengers and they took her. One commentary says they they accosted her. This this idea of aggressive movement. This, This is now not asking. This is assault. And I want you to see that this happens because his guard is down. God, help me. Messengers took her, and she came to him, and this is interesting language, and he lay with her. It doesn't communicate they lay together. We go to actually 2 Samuel chapter number 13, where Amnon rapes his his half-sister, Tamar. It says, and he laid with her. These were signs. If if the messengers came back and say, "Uh, King, she didn't want to come, we had to take her. These are signs that you are doing something. Mm. 
trying to have something that belongs to God your way. David didn't watch the signs. I'm going to be honest here. It, it, these are hard things to hear. and We want to sanitize the story of David. But let's be clear that this is not simply adultery. I know a lot of times you read in commentaries, they want to call this adultery. Well, she did it. No, 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 no. This is something far worse than adultery. This is one person imposing their influence, manipulating their authority on another person. This was not consensual. David here abuses his influence and power. He doesn't invite her. He doesn't woo her. He, they take her. David had every opportunity to see the signs and exit the offering. I want us to think about this. Let, let's leave David alone. Whew. Where have you ignored the signs? How do we do a better job of seeing the signs of sin in our life? One of the things I love about this picture is that David didn't do this in isolation. One of the servants produced a sign. Some of us, thank you, Holy Spirit, we sin in isolation because sometimes if we get around, we tell somebody else what we're doing, they would tell you, you know you ain't got no business doing that. This is one of the beauties of being a part of a biblical community, that we have people that can hold us accountable. Are you hearing me? There are signs. I can't speak for nobody else. Ryan, I've had, oh, I had my signs, Lord. Some of y'all, y'all might not grow. I grew up like super spiritual, and I'll say, Lord, if you don't want me to do it, then turn off my phone right now. Lord, if I don't need to go there, make sure my car don't work when I get in it. Well, Lord, it turned over, so, you know, my guy's a full tank of gas, too. I'm going to get there and back. We're trying, watch this, we're trying to put it on God to do something he's given us responsibility for. Signs were all there. Here's what we end up doing. We try to justify our decisions. Lord, if you didn't want me to do it, you would have you stopped me. Are you watching your signs? Last week, we got to move quickly here. Third thing I think we need to watch, we see this in the story of David, we got to be careful of, are his values. What are your values? What I'm learning as I get older is that your values are not defined when things go well. They are defined under pressure. What really is important to you will be clarified under stress. Your convictions are revealed when things are difficult. Not what you say when everything is going well. Come on, somebody say, man. Amen. Listen, I got to be honest with you. It's easy. It's easy to say, Lord, everything that I have belongs to you when I got more than enough. It's easy to tithe, Doc, when the refrigerator is full and the gas tank is full and I got the shoes I want to wear. <laughs> but if you have never been in that season where you're having to look at all three of your things and like, man, I got to go without one of these things. Faithfulness is not really defined where there's no opportunity to be unfaithful. Your ability to fly is always based on your potential to fall. Here it is. That the values of David is actually revealed, and it, this is what probably broke my heart the most. When I saw this narrative, this hero that we had seen for the past almost 24 chapters between 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, all these things were there in those spaces. They just weren't the right conditions. Let's look at verse number 5. Watch the text. 2 Samuel 11, 5 through 9. And the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. That bro didn't even say nothing to her. 
Watch his, watch his heart. Watch his heart, y'all. Send me Uriah the Hittite. So you knew this was Bathsheba's husband. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab was doing. <laughs> How's everybody doing out there, man? Y'all good? How are the people were doing and how the war was going. I know I'm not out there. I know I'm supposed to be out there, but y'all winning, right? Y'all don't need me. Verse 8, then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Uriah went out of the king's house and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his Lord and did not go down to his house. Y'all see what David's trying to do? He says, listen, um, I just got your wife pregnant. But to keep it looking like it was me, man, why don't you go home? See your wife. My brother Dominique Ward and his mother would say, go home and minister. <laughs> I said, that's worship. <laughs> but, but, but Uriah is an honorable man. In these portions of the verses, we see a dishonorable man contrasted by an extremely honorable, faithful man. He says, go down. But Uriah says, no, nah, I, can't, I can't do that. This is where in the text the bad goes to worse. The same David that would not dishonor God by standing against King Saul, the same David who did not have a problem here dishonoring Bathsheba, even dishonoring Uriah is now faced, I believe, with something deeply convicting. And here is someone that I have shown unfaithfulness to, but they are faithful to me. I want you to see this. The temptation, hear me, always promises more than it can provide and always demands more than we can handle. Sin is the very thing that we do within. It is, it is selfish in every sense. I'm learning this, that sin always hurts more than you. Y'all see this? The sin has dishonored Bathsheba, and now he's about to involve Uriah. David sins against God, sins against Bathsheba, and now he's about to sin against Uriah in another way. As king, y'all got to see this, he was supposed to protect, and yet he perverts. And now, all of a sudden, here's the issue of his values. He's concerned about his own honor. I want to cover this up so I don't look bad. Got to see this. It sounds familiar. Same issue with King Saul. He's worried about his own honor. He's worried about his own reputation. He's worried about what it will look like for him. He's worried about what would happen if people knew what he had done. He's worried about if what was done in the dark ever came to the light. And when you are in sin, you will always use sin to try to cover up sin. Uriah's values are stark contrast to David's. Verse number 10 and 12, when, when they told David Uriah did not go down to the house, David said to Uriah, have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, the ark and, and Israel and Judah dwell in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. I want you to see this. Here, they're contrasting each other. David took advantage of his privileges. Uriah is at home, but he, he does not take advantage of his privileges. He thinks about the people he's supposed to be serving with, and he says, no, I could do this, but I won't. David, on the other hand, says, because I can do this, I will. You got to see the contrast between Uriah and David here. David said to Uriah, remain here today also and tomorrow, and I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. Joab is the general of the army. He sends back Uriah. But Uriah says, I got to honor God. I got to honor others, and I got to honor my king. Verse 12 and 13 shows us that 
King David attempts again to cover his sin and protect his honor. He doubled down on this foolishness. He says, all right, Uriah, I want you to come over for dinner. He tries to get Uriah, what? Drunk. Hoping that he would compromise and that he would go home and lay down with his wife. But again, he does not. This leads to David's plan for murder. I want you to see that when your guard is down, you don't even realize when you are the one in sin. It's like people who um, cook fried fish. You, you, you ever made fried fish? In fried fish? Man, every time I meet somebody that, that, that like just got done making fried fish, I don't think they realize they smell like fried fish. It's me. Every, every, everything smells like it's on you, and you don't even know it's on you. Is what happens with sin, church. Hear me. David's plan for murder is right here, verse number 14. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter, he wrote, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him that he may be struck down and die. David sends this man back to war with his own death sentence in his hand. Yeah, yeah. When you're trying to cover sin in your own strength, it always demands more sin. Look at where David is now. A man that is now willing to, in order to protect his honor, he'll let another man die. While it was not David's spear that killed Uriah, it was his hand. He says, send Uriah out to the, to the, to the hardest part of the battle, and then I want y'all not to hope that he dies, ensure that he dies by pulling everyone back and leaving him there. If there is anybody that understands the implications of this, it's the warrior, David. This was not an accident. He, he, he strategized, he schemed, he connived to try to cover his own sin. Y'all, we have to be on guard. In order that his honor may live, he would let an honorable man die. He would murder him. The text says that Joel would let us know that other men died as well unnecessarily, along with Uriah. Joab follows the order of the king at the expense of the other men. But in these final verses of chapter number 11, as I close here, it actually paints the last picture of his values. He's so determined to protect his own honor. Watch what he does here in verse 26 and 27. He's so self-centered, so selfish. It says, when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she lamented over her husband. I want you to hear this. She didn't know that David was the one that killed him. Watch what happens. Verse 27, and when the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. I want to wrestle with this a little bit because I'm like, which part? And I looked at this part specifically, just in these verses, what he did, just in these two verses, displeased the Lord. It says, and when the morning was over, David sent and brought the woman whose husband he murdered and made her his wife. And y'all, and laid with her again. I was like, man, why would he do this? Was, was he trying to be the nice guy? No. He was trying to look like the hero. Let's remember the story. Remember the law of the kinsman redeemer. She's a widow now. Can you imagine? Oh, man, that David, man, he's a swell guy. One of his mighty men lost, uh, died, and, and now to prevent that mighty man's wife from being poor, being alone, he makes her his wife. Do you see how even that decision was about David's honor? And this thing that David, here it is. He says, but, that word but simply means, he's talking about what was just said. He thought this would regain honor for him, but God is saying that thing actually displeases me. 
Y'all, I want you to ask yourself the question, what are your values? Are you more concerned with your honor than God's? Do, do, do you think more about how you sin against others or do you think about how you first sin against God? David here is still trying to protect himself, trying to promote his honor after Bathsheba has mourned properly. He says, come be my wife. He marries this widow, hoping to bring himself honor. Even this gesture was solely about him, trying to be the hero. What's interesting, y'all, when we read this text? That, at, that he already had six wives. <laughs> Go back and read the narrative. He already, he already had six wives. It wasn't like he was looking for a wife. He wasn't looking for his sweet thing. Guard was down. Selfish, self-centered, despicable, disgusting. This thing that he does here displeases God. I can't imagine. You got to think about this when we see David in chapter number 15 where the Spirit of the Lord of 1 Samuel is taken from King Saul. And when actually he tells Solomon, like, uh, uh, he tells Samuel, like, listen, we're going to send another king, and he's going to be better than King Saul. I can't imagine that God is like, man, I thought you would be better. Both of y'all, only concerned about yourself. The story of David and Bathsheba are just one of the tragic upcoming realities of selfish men in power. But God in his providential wisdom does not leave David in this place. We see chapter number 12 where God, the Bible says, sends Nathan. Nathan tells David a parable, a story. And when David hears the story, the Bible says that he's angry. Because this rich man took the one sheep of the poor man. Nathan reveals, hey, you're that man. What's different between David and King Saul is that David here repents. He repents of his sin. He acknowledges that he has sinned against God. It leads us, unfortunately, to one of the hardest verses to read in this story in chapter number 12, verse 15 through 16, where the text says that God afflicted the child that was born, the child that was born out of this lustful, unguarded king. Verse 15, then Nathan went to his house and the Lord afflicted the child that Uriah's wife bore to David. I got to like the text here. <laughs> she, she was married to David, but the text says, no, you're not going to dishonor her like that. Uriah's wife. And the text says that he became sick. And David, therefore, look at who this person is now. He sought God on behalf of the child. And David fasted and went in and laid all night on the ground. Verse 18, unfortunately, the child dies after seven days because of the sickness that was afflicted on him by God. David prayed as a humble sinner in need of a great Savior. God had already made up his mind. This child of lust, out of abuse, out of rape, would, would become a reminder of David's sin, a sign of contempt for God's commandment. Watch this before all the nations. Wow. Nathan says to David, God has removed his sin from you. He does tell him, though, he doesn't remove the consequences. Listen to me, church. You can choose your sin but you don't get to choose your consequences. The story is extremely disturbing as I've been wrestling over this all week. I kept seeing, man, Bathsheba has had a rough year. She was taken by the king, raped, taken advantage of, forced to sleep with another man's Another woman's husband. Her husband dies. Her son dies. As 
not until verse 24 of chapter number 12 does, does David actually do something to promote or connote value to her. It says that he went in to comfort her. Every other interaction seemed to be to use her for his own advantage. But we see out of this repentance, he sees her differently. It started because he wasn't on guard. I want y'all to hear this. We must be on guard. Here's what I want you to think about. I want you to ask yourself a couple of questions to go through this week. Where are the areas in your life that you need to be on guard against sin? I want you to think about it. Another way to think about this is, what are the areas of your life that have the potential to become quicksand? Quicksand is for me, and accountability in some of the relationships that I have with men, it's, it's almost like our code word. I could text a brother and say, hey man, I'm, I need you to pray for me. I'm, I might be in some quicksand. You, 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 you are in a place where under the right conditions you could fall to sin. Second question, where do you need to be more watchful? Where do you need to be more watchful? Third question here is, where do you need to repent? Repenting is not simply acknowledging your sin, it's turning away from it. And for some of you, fourthly, where can you hope again? After you have sinned against someone or you have been sinned against, for some of you today, I need you to hear that there is hope past where you have been. That God is the God that sees. He has not turned a blind eye. You are not so broken he cannot restore. You are not so far that he cannot reach. This is our God. I love what the author does in Matthew chapter number one. I want to put this verse up for you and we'll close right here. As the author is going through the lineage of Jesus, Matthew is trying to make the connection between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New, just covering these 400 years of silence. And they go through the lineage of Jesus. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And here in verse 6, it says, And Jesse, the father of David, the king. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. When I read these verses, I, I was grateful because the text won't let the reader identify her by what she was going through. The author identifies her by, I believe, her honor. She was the wife of Uriah, a faithful, honorable man. Is that right? That your story, thank you, Holy Spirit, is not confined to tragedy. Your identity, thank you, God, is not found in what someone else did to you. Your identity isn't found in what God did for you through Christ Jesus. Today, I come to offer you a warning. Church, be on guard. Be on guard. Don't Turn your back on the cage. When my mother was here, she would say, don't fall asleep on the couch. Because the enemy, sin, your flesh, a wild animal. And it is better to avoid temptation than to try to resist sin.